Do I say it? Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to our YouTube uh, forum. Usually we would do this on our phone call town hall, tele-town hall meetings, but because of budget cuts, those are a lot more expensive. So we're going the cheap way, but I know lots of people send us questions, so we'll be able to answer them. Hopefully you'll interact with us. And I'm here with Devin, who is works in my communications department. She has a whole pile of questions here that you've all asked, and uh, we'll try to get through as many as possible. Okay. Uh, we'll start off with a couple of these and a reminder to anybody who is watching, um, you can continue to post questions on our Facebook wall or tweet at us at, at Senator, Mar at Senator Begich, um with the hashtag Begich Town Hall and we'll try to get some live if they do come through. Um, so it's fishing season in Alaska, so let's start with talking about fish a little bit. We've got a question from Heather Spade Sterling um, who wants to know how we can reverse the power of Monsanto and force mm -hmm. GMO seed order ownership and contamination of our food without even labeling? How can we, how can we fix this? What well, are you doing? Well, first off, uh, you're right, it is fishing season. My son did some dip netting, got a couple of fish, which is great, and I understand they've opened up again for 24 hours, so a lot of fish, which is good for all of us. But on this one specifically, on GMOs, uh, you know, this is a big issue. Every time we post, a matter of fact, on our Facebook page, lots of people sign in. First, we've been working on one element, which is frankenfish, uh, which has been a big issue this is genetically engineered atlantic salmon uh, because their salmon population in atlantic has gone down so far companies want to produce basically artificial fish we think this is a big problem when i say we the whole delegation is opposed to this idea of bringing in artificial fish into our marketplace also we know from alaska uh, we have sustainable fisheries this is where we should focus not on bringing in uh, fake fish frankenfish i've voted a couple times uh, when there's been amendments up to go after not only the issues of genetically engineered fish, but genetically engineered foods. Because people should know what they're getting. And this is really important. I think we, I get that some companies want to produce this product, but people should know what kind of food they're getting, where it's made and how it's produced. We were successful back on the fish issue in the Appropriations Committee on a 15 to 14 vote, one vote margin, so I'm glad I'm on that committee this year, uh, to ensure that FDA uh, is allowed to spend money to ensure that if this fake fish gets to the market, it must be labeled so people know what it is. We'll see if this passes the Senate in total and if the House accepts it. But uh, we are definitely you know, working on many fronts here when it comes to GMO or genetically engineered. You have a couple modified. bills too, don't you? We have a couple bills. Well, one is to uh, ban or not allow uh, frankenfish to come to the market. If that doesn't happen, then we have another bill on labeling to make sure that, again, when you walk into the marketplace, wherever it is, when you see fresh Alaska salmon, you know it. And when there's genetically engineered fish, it says it. And what we would say all the time is, I would put money down who's going to get the fish sale, and it's going to be Alaska. Because once people know the difference between the product, they will buy Alaska fresh product, or any fresh seafood product over genetically engineered. And it's a, great, it's a great issue in a lot of ways because it touches families. And families want to know, especially these days, we, you know, Deborah and I have an 11-year-old son. We want to make sure what kind of food he's eating. Uh, we want to know where it comes from. We want to know the quality of it. And if it's not labeled, then we have no idea. And there's a lot of stuff now being produced in our food chain that I think people would have a lot of questions about. Mm -hmm. But that's a pretty hot issue on, I know, on our Facebook page. Mm -hmm. It's true. It gets a lot of likes. Um, so along the same vein, uh, we actually have a question about the Safe Chemicals Act too. So not necessarily dealing with fish, but certainly about protecting our consumers. Um, and so Callie Skinner, and I apologize in advance if I have messed up anybody's name, we're just reading as best we can. Um, and she would like to know what the status of your bill to eliminate, um, oh I'm sorry, I apologize. Actually, you know what, <laughs> we got the question wrong, but there is, you have been doing some work on the Safe Chemicals Act, yeah. and I know we had a number of questions about this on our Facebook page, so if you want to speak to that, then. We'll do that real quick, and that's the TOSCA Act. This is to ensure uh, people know, and there's a process of understanding what kind of chemicals are being produced by the chemical industry. There is a bill, a bipartisan bill. I, I think it has about 18 senators, give or take, both Democrats and Republicans on this bill. Uh, I'm very uh, encouraged by its movement, because the last two or three years, there's been a Democratic bill, and then there's been a Republican bill. And honestly, this year, 
when the Democratic bill came up, I did not sign on. I was the only Democrat not to re-sign up on the bill. And the reason was very simple. I know I get a lot of emails on this and a lot of people start asking me, why, why are you not on that bill? Because I was fed up with having the same old game every year where we'd have a Democratic bill, a Republican bill, neither bill would move. And I wasn't going to put my name on another thing but just for the bumper sticker. And so I waited and I met with uh, the Republican who was sponsoring his bill, talked to him about what I thought was possible. And the end result now is we have a bipartisan bill in front of us, which we've now signed on to. Um, <coughs> so we have another question now. Um, regarding the sequester and help for furloughed employees. I know that there are a number of folks up in Alaska who have been furloughed. Um, so Robert Gray actually wants to know what's being done to stop sequestration, and mm -hmm. Sherry Polito Boker um, has a similar question, okay. um, if you want to speak to that. Sure. This is, uh, for those that aren't familiar with sequestration, this was a budget arrangement almost two years ago now. That required, more than two years now, required that the federal government make an eight percent cut across the board in every agency. The end result has been every agency has taken the hit and furloughs have occurred. I mean, in our office, we've, we've done furloughs. I mean, everyone in my office has been subjected at, at some point uh, to a furlough or a status in their salary. Uh, in my case, uh, I've even put money back for every day my staff has taken a furlough day, I put money back into the federal treasury for my day of salary at that, at that level. Um, on the federal government side, it has had some impact, no question about it, uh, on delivery of services, but we are in the sequestration period now. We have a budget that passed the Senate. I didn't vote for it, but it is a budget. It did pass. There is a budget that passed the House. In the budget that passed the Senate, it resolves this issue, solves the sequestration, does better strategic cuts and management of the budget, but we cannot get the House to come to the table and sit down and negotiate out a final package. Until they come to the table, we're stuck in the sequestration period. I think next budget year, which starts October 1, we'll be right back into this again. More cuts um, and also uh, impacting services in Alaska and across the state or across the country. You know, we're, I'm not afraid of cutting the budget, which I've proposed things and voted for. But sequestration, this kind of wholesale approach, is really uh, the wrong approach. It's kind of like taking a meat axe and slicing away. We should do more strategic focus cuts, which we have gotten great recommendation from people all across the state. We've proposed some ideas. That's the better way. So at the end of the day, sequestration uh, is going to be in place until we get a budget deal done. The House and Senate passed the budget, but we can't get the House to sit down and form a conference committee to resolve it. Mm -hmm. um, so since you're talking about process right now here in the Senate, which can <laughs> obviously get a little bit confusing. Get confusing and boring. Yes. <laughs> um, Simon Howell has a question for you. Um, he wants to know, do you believe that you're going to sponsor a piece of, if you're going to sponsor a piece of legislation, you have, should have to demonstrate competency on the subject? Oh, <laughs> that's an interesting, um, I'll probably disagree on that. I'll tell you why. You, because the minute, you know, there's a lot of issues. If you ask me about uh, genetically engineered fish, before I introduced it, I would just know very little about it. But because of my introduction of the piece of legislation and learning more about it and engaging with people about it and talking to people and having hearings, I've become, uh, you know, I forget the words you use, but I'm, I'm more in tune with the subject matter than I was, you know, several months ago or so, almost two years ago. So I think it's, you got to have something that you're interested in. You may not know everything. And, and honestly, this process that we are in, you want to engage on issues to learn more about issues, but also improve what legislation you're bringing forward. Now, one thing I do oppose is people who just throw stuff down because it sounds good, which, you know, we just voted on an amendment on the floor today that, you know, I, I probably passed 90 to zero, 90 to 10, or maybe even 100 to zero, because the person who wanted to put it on the floor just wanted to be known for saying it. It had nothing to do with really the bill we're working on. So, no, I probably would, I want people to know their issue, but they learn more about it also as they work it and introduce it. Um, okay, and then we've got another question from Mike Heedle. Um, and he would like to know, if the government is so hard pressed for money, why are we sending it out for foreign aid? So he has a question about why we're sending our foreign money. Foreign aid. Yeah. Um, foreign aid is about $60 billion out of a $3.7 trillion budget, give or take a few dollars there. Um, 
I think your point is, we're, I'm a supporter of foreign aid. I think, for example, we give a little over $3 billion to Israel. 95% of that money comes back to the United States for buying United States products. Most of the time when we have this foreign aid, we have requirements for it to be utilized to purchase American products that they need. So we're actually putting the money out there, helping an ally, and then, then it's coming back to us and our economy. Now, there is a larger question here that I do think maybe uh, Mike has in part of his question, and that is, for example, we give foreign aid to some countries that then start bad-mouthing us, turning it against us, not really being helpful. Uh, in those situations, then I have some heartburn where we need to put some strong requirements of what, what we expect of them. Because if we're giving money, example would be to Pakistan, and here we are in Afghanistan where we've had some incredible uh, efforts over the last 10 years and many Alaska troops over there and, and people who've lost their lives. When you're in Afghanistan and we know Al-Qaeda is working in Pakistan and the Pakistani government is not assisting us in this endeavor and we're giving aid to Pakistan, then we should be putting more parameters on this money because um, part of this is to build allies not that people work against us. So I think a lot of us understand that, but there are some really good reasons why we give some foreign aid. Israel is a great example. Um, now we're going to shift gears actually to Social Security. So we've got um, a couple people who are interested in this. Alice Garrity would like to know um, what the chances are of passing the Preserving and Protecting Social Security Act this year, which is your bill. Right. This is actually, I just did a uh, interview with a TV station with Senator Harkin, who's the chair of the uh, health, education, labor, and pension committee. This is where this bill would fall under. He has a bill similar to mine. Um, I'm not sure we'll be successful this year, but our first goal is to get Social Security out of the debate of a budget deficit because Social Security has never contributed one penny to the deficit of this country. Second, it's a retirement program. It is not an entitlement program. This is money that people have invested into a retirement system through their wages and deserve to get paid back. My bill does a couple things that are pretty critical. One, by a simple change to make sure that everyone pays into it that earns a wage. So if you make more than $113,000, that you will be continue to be required to pay into Social Security, because right now you don't. After you make your first $113,000 in a year on wages, after that, you don't pay anymore. And our view is everyone, if you're making a wage, you need to pay into it. Um, on, that will add about 70 to 75 years to its longevity, which is important to get sustainability. Second, we change the COLA or the Consumer Price Index. So as prices go up for those that are on Social Security, the amount you get from Social Security will reflect those increases. For example, you know, what Devin may buy is going to be much different than a senior. She's uh, you know, living here in D.C., lives a different lifestyle. She's not probably having 30 prescription drugs. She's not worrying about limited transportation. She, she has a much different needs. The way it works under Social Security now is it's based on what we need, not what seniors need. Seniors have a different costing for their lifestyle. So we change the CPI. We make sure that everyone pays in, and we make sure that that money goes right back in Social Security. Uh, that's what our bill does. We're very excited about it. A lot of groups support it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think once we get past kind of the budget debates and we can focus on this issue, it's an easy one to solve and has great success. Just a follow-up question on that. Sue Skinner has a question um, by your other Social Security bill, um, which would eliminate the Social Security Act uh, windfall offset. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So this is the Social Security Fairness Act. Mm -hmm. What this does is there's about 10,000 Alaskans, about 2 million people across the country, that today, for example, you might be a teacher in Alaska, you, you work all your life, but in the summertime, you're working a second job. Maybe you're working in a retail store and you're paying in Social Security, but your job as a teacher did not pay in Social Security. So when you retire from teaching and you start getting that Social Security check or that teacher's retirement check, and at the same time you think you're going to get that Social Security check from those wages you earn in that second job, you're not going to. That's going to your retirement from teachers will be deducted from your Social Security because there's a, a clause uh, which eliminates windfall elimination, which eliminates uh, that uh, credit. So in other words, you might work two or three different jobs, and because one of them didn't pay into Social Security, you get penalized for that. Against the Social Security, you did pay into, which we think is unfair. 
We think if you had one, two, three, four jobs, whatever it is, and they all have retirements, none of them should offset any of them. And this is something that affects 2 million Americans and 10,000 plus Alaskans. So we're gonna do our best to fix this while we work on Social Security. It's expensive to fix, but my view is if you paid into Social Security, you should get your check back. Um, okay, we have another question from Brian Gundlock, and he would like to know what we're doing about the NSA's ability to collect phone records. So I know you've been working hard on that, Senator. Yeah, this is a big issue. You know, I voted against uh, FISA and several other moments or amendments that we've had where it, uh, I thought, reached and went too far in information that the federal government could get from American citizens. Here's the issue with this whole issue around NSA. We know we have to have good security in this country because it has changed. It's changed from the days when you just walk on a plane to now TSA and all these other security checks. But we also have to make sure it is protecting individuals' rights to privacy also. And there's a due process. Right now there's a court that the NSA has and they go to them and ask for warrants to get information maybe from the phone company or the telecom company or whatever it might be. When doing that, uh, the courts then make the judgment and they go get the information. The worry that we have, and I have, is that w the law was passed. Our concern is the courts are over-interpreting the law, expanding farther than what Congress set it up to be. And this is what I worried about. That's why I voted against it. That's why I voted against the Patriot Act, FISA. Because anytime you give these tools to people who collect data or intel, they will get as much and go as far as the limits they think are and expand even beyond. Because their job is to get information, as much information. My view is uh, we need to have better oversight and a balance between security and privacy. And I think there's a way to do this. But right now, um, there's a great debate on this, and I'm glad there's a great debate. Because, again, I voted against all this stuff for the last five years because I was worried they would go too far. So we've had good meetings about it. There's legislation being kicked around. Uh, I've supported some legislation that's on the table now that again uh, creates a balance between security and privacy and better notification and overview. Okay, um, and then we have another question um, from Alicia Busick. And she would like to know what bills are being drafted to help youth get involved with science, technology, in biology, so some STEM items, STEM. which mm -hmm. I know you're particularly yeah. interested and passionate about. Yeah, this is, uh, there's a lot of legislation being kicked around now. We have a couple of pieces of legislation around STEM and the science, technology, engineering, math, and I'll throw biology in there too, that's good, that's a science, so I'll add that. Uh, but the, I, you know, when you think about where we are in this country compared to other countries in these fields, we are now, you know, in the 20s, you know, 23rd, 24th, 25th in ranking among our peers around the world in these areas, which is appalling. We should be on the top. As a matter of fact, uh, last week my son was in a robotics uh, program uh, in Alaska. He's there for the summer, and uh, he loved it. He was able to program. He had a teammate. They built a robot, programmed it. Uh, he's very excited about this science this week. He's doing film and learning how to develop and produce and use technology in creating uh, movies and shorts, which I think are fantastic. We gotta inspire our young people and science and technology and engineering and math is a way to do it, and especially in younger ages. So we have some legislation pending. We have been working with the rewrite to No Child Left Behind, which I think has been disastrous for this country and for our state, but working to improve that around these areas. Because if we do this and do it right, uh, we will have clearly the next generation, we will no longer be in the 23rd, 24th, 20, we'll be in that top tier of science, technology, and engineering. So, uh, big issue, and interesting to note, there's actually a generational issue here in the Senate. A lot of us who have younger families are very focused on this, because we think this is the future for this country to be competitive on a worldwide market. Okay, uh, just enough time for a couple more questions. Uh, we have a question from Charles Bingham, who asks, when are you going to take a stand against Pebble Mine and support our fishing industry and our food? And I know that- I know um, Charles. <laughs> so Charles, I know you. <laughs> and I know that Granny Robbie Douglas has a similar question. Um, she would also like to hear what you have to say about sure. Pebble Mine. 
Um, let, me, let me just say this about Pebble Mine, and I'll be very short on it. We know EPA is right now doing its final review of its peer review of the science. Uh, I'm waiting for that to be completed before I determine uh, where I'll stand on this issue. I've always said in the past that we're not going to trade off uh, short-term resource gain or job gain for long-term renewable resources like our fisheries. But let's base it on science. Now, I know some are very passionate about this and believe the science has already spoken. Uh, it's important. I, I objected to EPA extending. I thought they could make their decision sooner. I know some people wanted them to have more time. I believe they have enough information. They need to prepare their report, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I'll focus my response based on the science not the politics, and not uh, the propaganda wars on both sides. And I know some people don't like that. I've been in great debates over this, that some people say, well, you need to take a stand right now. Well, let's do it for the first time, maybe based on science, not just on who has the best media out there. That's how I'm going to approach it. Uh, my, I anticipate September, uh, that EPA report should be mid-September. I expect it to be done, and then I'll make a very definitive um, the state, statement and decision on Pebble Mine at that point. Okay. Um, we have another question from Brent Ramsey, uh, who would like to know if you think it's appropriate to increase student debt by doubling student loan interest rates as a means of raising revenue. And if not, what are you doing to prevent this and keep student debt as close to manageable as possible, particularly timely for this yeah. week? We're going to be voting on the student loan uh, issue uh, this week. Matter of fact, for some of you that may not know this, for seven years, I chaired the Student Loan Corporation for the State of Alaska, <clears throat> State of Alaska, as well as the Post-Secondary Education Commission for the State of Alaska for seven years, and managed uh, the, the loan issues uh, for the state and helped craft uh, Alaska Advantage Program and others to help make sure students could have access to resources to go to higher education. So we're going to have a bill in front of us. There's uh, I'm not very comfortable with the current bill uh, because of the way it's structured. It does have the first few years will be low rates, 3.6%, 4%, something in that range. But it's based on the 10-year Treasury bill. So as that goes up, so are the rates. It does have a cap that it can't exceed 8.25%, which I like the fact that there's a longer-term solution. I'm nervous about those rates. So there are three amendments that are being offered. Uh, to solve and lower these rates even lower. I'll be supporting all those amendments. And then the final bill, I'll wait to see the outcome, but I want to give stability to the student loans that are out there or the future student loans and keep this rate as low as possible. So that will be up this week. So you'll see the result in, like I said, I'm going to vote for these three amendments and then I'm not sure what I'll do on the final bill if these amendments don't pass. Now saying that, there's another part of this question, which I think was part of your uh, question one was about the interest rates, but debt that currently is accumulated by students is almost 1.2 trillion dollars, more than credit card debt. Actually, is now preventing first-time homeowners buying their new home because they have too much student loan debt. We should do everything we can to refinance that debt, just like I am. Uh, I look at the student loan uh, interest rates. I look at the long-term debt. If we can loan money to banks at three quarters of a percent, one percent, one and a half percent. I don't see why we can't help refinance this debt at rates as low as that. And you signed on to a bill, actually. I've signed on to Senator Warren's bill that does just that. Because if we do this right, imagine if you have this enormous debt on you today. And maybe your interest rates are seven, nine percent, somewhere in there. And we come to you and say, look, because you've been paying on time, you've been doing it all right, we're going to refinance that at, you know, two years or two percent or even three percent. The amount of money you will save will mean more money in your pocket. So if you want to buy that house, you want to expand and remodel where you live, you want to go to maybe take on a master's program or whatever it might be, you'll have that money available. So I support Senator Warren's bill, which gets these rates low. Uh, we'll have three amendments up this week on student loan. And then I'll work to figure out what we can do in the long-term debt. Okay, um, we have time for one more question. And it's from Brandon Meston, who would like to know if there's an update right now on the IELTS and EIS um, and its evaluation. 
This is the environmental impact statement for Eielson. Eielson Air Force Base, as you know, we've been fighting the Pentagon on them relocating the F-16s. They want to move them to Anchorage. Even the mayor of Anchorage thinks that's a dumb idea. Uh, we all think the delegation thinks this is a bad idea for a lot of strategic reasons of why and how important Eielson is to our new redeployment to the Pacific Rim. We have a new focus by the Pentagon on that. But in the process of this, they have to do an environmental impact statement. The impact statement has public hearings going on right now. We testified last week. Uh, this will be a piece of the puzzle, but not the final decision on Alice. And I want to make that very clear. So there's a lot of turmoil over the CIS. As you know, they've already said the best alternative in this environmental impact statement is to move the F-16s to, to Anchorage, which we disagree with. This will be completed. Once that's completed, that will be set aside for a larger issue called the strategic assessment. This is being done by the Pentagon to look at all the areas on the Pacific Rim that have U.S. bases and determine what areas are the best to locate our military assets for in case of response that we need to do to the Pacific Rim. There's no question in my mind that Alaska is going to be the number one location because of how close we are to everything. Once that strategic review is done, that will be combined with the EIS and a final decision being made in late fall. My hope, even with the EIS saying move to Anchorage, that the strategic review will say, Allison is strategically important, not only for what we're doing today, but what I think of the future is. And this is the future of Allison. It's our F-35s. F-35s are the new platform for all our military and our allies to utilize. This plane is an amazing plane. And so my hope is that in the fall, that they would get this Allison issue off the table, that they keep it where it is in the sense of F-16s, but they also announce that F-35s would be a good location, should be in Allison. We're pushing hard on that. We've been pushing hard on that for the last three years, or four years actually, you know, on that issue that F-35 should be placed in Allison. So we'll see, but it's, you know, I, I don't consider where we're at bad. Uh, there's a lot of public hearings everyone has to go to and testify. We just got to get through this and then get the strategic review. And that's mm -hmm. fall time we should have that. Um, and just lastly, Judy Timmick would like to know when you're coming to visit Big Lake. Judy, as long as you still have the skidoos, I'm all in. Uh, but I do miss having wings and things with you. I probably shouldn't do promotions, but they're the greatest wings. Uh, and so I'll look forward to seeing you. As you know, Nellen uh, Bud, who has worked for us and worked for me here in the Senate office, worked for me when I was mayor, and Judy and uh, Nell and I all came about the same time working in the city government. Uh, she just retired, so you should make sure you uh, buy her uh, a good dinner, Judy. See you in Big Lake. I know the weather's good, too. So that's all we have time for today. Um, please do follow Senator Begich on Twitter at, at Senator Begich, uh, and do like our Facebook page and visit regularly. Uh, Senator Begich does check in and likes to answer your questions. We'll try and do this again uh, in the near future. Thank you all very much. I appreciate you taking the time. I know the weather is superb in Alaska right now. So thank you for maybe probably sitting on your deck trying to look at the, TV, the, the uh, screen on your computer. But thanks for participating.